Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to start my talk and just don't hesitate to interrupt me. If you have any questions, perfectly fine. If you want to ask them in French, that's fine too. Canada is a bilingual country, so be perfectly happy to take uh, questions in French. I'm going to start my talk by telling you a little bit about one of my all-time favorite movie scenes from the legendary cult movie Spinal Tap. Right? Spinal Tap is a faux documentary about a British rock band. And at a certain point in the movie, Nigel, the uh, band's lead guitar player, is giving a journalist, Marty over here, a tour of his stage equipment. Right? And Nigel is pointing out, he's bragging about his Marshall amplifiers, and he's pointing out that his amps go to 11. Right? Usually a regular guitar amplifier goes from 0 to 10. His go from 0 to 11. And he's pointing out that therefore his amp is one louder than all the other amps. And the journalist Marty is clearly confused and is pointing out, but why don't you just make the 10 setting the loudest setting, right? Because 10 out of 10 equals 11 out of 11. It shouldn't, it shouldn't make a difference, right? And then Nigel is just replying, well, these go to 11, right? So it's a classic scene. I like it so much because it's given us a perfect illustration of a very classic reasoning bias, namely racial bias or denominator neglect. Basically, what Nigel is doing, he's focusing on the absolute difference between 10 and 11. It's true, 11 is one more than 10, right? But if you take the ratio into account, if you take the denominator into account, 10 out of 10 obviously equals 11 out of 11. Okay? Now, it's fun to laugh at Nigel in a movie, but the funny thing actually is that a lot of educated adults show this exact same bias, right? This is an example, uh, one of the uh, heuristics and biases tasks that hasn't been presented today yet. It's the Epstein's ratio bias task. And it's very simple, you get two trays filled with uh, white and red jelly beans, and you're being told you get to draw one bean from each of the trays without looking, and the question is from which tray should you draw to maximize your chance of winning a red, uh, of drawing a red jelly bean. Right. And what most people feel is that they should draw from the large tray. Why? Because there's more red over here. There are more red jelly beans, right? That's true, but of course, if you take the proportion of red and white jelly beans into account, it's pretty clear that the small tray is giving you a higher chance of winning, namely 1 out of 10, 10% chance, and over here, 9 uh, out of 100, so only a 9% chance of drawing a red bean. Okay. So we know that people are biased in this case. So the exact same bias that uh, Nigel is showing in the spinal tap example. And basically that's what people have been showing for at least half a century in reasoning and decision making field. That in a lot of classic reasoning tasks, the majority of educated people, university students, fail to give the correct response. And we have argued that people fail to do so because they're biased by heuristic thinking. The idea is that most of the time, people, when they are engaging in a decision-making reasoning task, they will base their conclusion on things like stereotypical beliefs, intuitive feelings, so-called heuristic thinking, and people will not always engage in more reflective, deliberate thinking. In and by itself, this intuitive heuristic thinking can be useful, but sometimes it will cue a response that conflicts with more logical, probabilistic considerations. For example, that's what you get in the ratio bias example, right? And in that case, these intuitions, these heuristics, are going to bias our decision making. Okay. And we've uh, developed in the field uh, a number of tasks just to study that bias and that conflict between intuitions and more logical, probabilistic, call it normative considerations, right? Uh, this is one classic example that I'm going to use throughout my talk just to demonstrate uh, the different uh, experiments and paradigms that I'm going to be using. It's called the base rate neglect task. It's pretty easy. You get some in information about the composition of a sample. From this, uh, in this case, for example, you're telling people, well, we tested a sample of 900, 995 Democrats and five Republicans, right? 
we made short personality descriptions of all individuals in the sample, and then one description got drawn randomly from that sample, and we're going to show you that description, right? And you're telling people, okay, so here's a description, this guy is 67, lives in Georgia, blah, 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 and you're asked which one of these two statements is most likely, right? But most people will say in this case, well, this guy is a Republican. Why? Because of the things he's doing. The task is constructed such that the description is going to give you a very strong intuitive response, right? It makes you think of the stereotype of a Republican, somebody who worked in the oil business, uh, lives in Georgia, Bible Belt, USA. Okay, but you were told if you would just uh, if you would, were just presented with the description, that would be perfectly fine. If you just look at the information value that's contained in the description, it's true that that person would be more likely to be a Republican than a Democrat. But you were told that the description was drawn from a sample where there were far more Democrats, right? Now, in this case, it's not totally impossible that this description will fit a Democrat, right? So if you combine those base rates with the information value contained in the description, right, then that should push the scale to the Democrats, the, the Democrat side, because there are just far more Democrats in the sample, right? Here too, you see that people will neglect the base rates, right? And there's other examples already presented today, conjunction fallacy task, uh, bat and ball problem, all the same, all these tasks capitalize on conflict. They cue a very strong intuitive response, and that response will conflict with some logical probabilistic principles and therefore bias our conclusions. Okay, so in the field we have developed the so-called dual process theory to account for that massive bias. It's pretty easy, we've got two systems for reasoning, a fast and automatic one, a slow and more deliberate system that draws on working memory resources. In and by itself, the heuristic system is very useful. Why? Because it's fast and it's cheap in the sense that it's not burdening our central executive working memory resources. It's automatic, right? It's easy, effortless. And in a lot of situations, it's going to cue responses that are actually valid, right? So it's a useful system. The only problem is that every now and then, intuitive thinking, heuristic thinking, will cue a response that enters in conflict with more uh, logical or probabilistic considerations, and in that case, what you'll need to do, you'll need to block, inhibit the intuitive system, override it, in order to give the correct logical or probabilistic response. That's the classic idea. And as you've all, as you, uh, already seen today, this theory nowadays is super popular. It's really hard to overestimate the popularity of this theory nowadays in the reasoning and decision-making field in general. Why? Because it's appealing, right? It's a very basic, appealing, simple story. It resonates with those classic distinctions that we know from the old uh, Greek philosophers, from, from Plato, for example, reasoning with the heart versus mind, passion versus ratio. In 2002, Daniel Kahneman got the Nobel Prize, one of the founding fathers of the heuristics and biases field proponent of the dual process model. So of course the fact that the Big Shot uh, was awarded with the Nobel Prize really helped to promote this uh, framework further. So very popular but also criticized, right? And one of the problems is that the actual the specific processing characteristics of the dual uh, process theory are not really clear, right? And one key problem is that the exact nature of the bias is also not clear. Basically, you might say that there are two, at least two different views on the nature of this bias. You have a group of people who argue that the basic problem is that people fail to detect that the cute intuitions conflict with more logical or probabilistic considerations, right? So why are you biased? Because you don't know, you don't realize that this heuristic intuition that's been cued in the problem is actually incorrect. Right? And the reason why you would fail to do so is because the idea is here that people are cognitive misers, right? they're lazy thinkers, they do not like to monitor the output of their heuristic system because that is hard, that will draw on executive working memory resources. Right? 
Therefore, because you will not monitor the output of your intuitions for conflict with more deliberate logical considerations, you're not going to detect that they're actually erroneous, that intuitions are not correct, that they conflict with these more logical considerations. And you find that view in, for example, the work of Kahneman, uh, Stanovich, and um, Jonathan Evans, right? But there's also another group of people, for example, Steve Sloman or uh, Seymour Epstein, who are that that is not the case and that people actually are detecting these conflicts, right? But what's, what is the problem according to them? The problem is that these heuristics, they're so salient, they're so tempting that although you might detect that they're incorrect, right, it's really hard to override and to inhibit them, right? So two different views on the nature of this bias and they're basically reflecting two different views on the way that the two systems are interacting, right? According to these guys, heuristic and the deliberate system, system one and system two, are interacting in a parallel fashion, right? Both systems are engaged always from the start at the same time. So of course you're going to notice that there's a conflict between them because you're always doing both at the same time. You're always thinking intuitively and deliberately at the same time. In the Evans and uh, Stanovich model, right, the interaction is more serial in nature. The idea is that you always start with the intuitive process, right, the system one, and it's only in some cases that people will activate system two. And the problem is actually the reason why you're not detecting that your intuition is incorrect. It's precisely because you're not opting for that system two activation at a later stage, right? So it's only system one. People are blind heuristic thinkers, okay? Therefore, they're not detecting that their intuitions might be incorrect or conflict with uh, logical or probabilistic considerations. Uh, the problem for the field was that up until some 10 years ago, there wasn't any real data to disentangle these two views. So what I've been doing in, in my work over the last 10 years, I've focused on that specific question. So what I've been trying to figure out is whether or not people are actually detecting these logic intuition conflicts, yes or no. And what I'm going to do today in my talk is I'm just going to walk you through some of our empirical findings, right? just to make sure that you get a general sense of how we test what we are studying, how we uh, come to the conclusions that I'll be presenting at the very end. So and after presenting some of the empirical data, some of the experiments, I'll actually point to some theoretical implications for the dual process model and for, for example, our view on individual differences in reasoning. Okay. First thing I have to tell you about the general design of all the different experiments that I'm going to show you, right? We always present people with these classic heuristics and biases tasks, right? So base rate neglect problem, conjunction fallacy, syllogisms, you've seen those before today. Um, the bat and ball problem, okay. And you know that these problems capitalize on conflict between intuitions and logic or probabilistic principles, right? But what we do is we do not only present these classic problems in which the cute intuitive response will conflict with normative considerations. We also present control problems in which both will cue the exact same response and there is no conflict. So I'm calling those uh, control or congruence, no conflict problems, the classic problems in which you do get conflicting uh, responses. I'm referring to those as incongruent or conflict problems. Now, it's important to point out here, when I'm referring to the correct response, I'm actually meaning the response that's traditionally considered normative or correct according to standard logic or probability theory. Because as you might know, there's a big debate in the field as to whether or not you can actually call these responses correct or not. So when I'm, when I'm, whenever I'm referring to the correct response, that's what I mean, right? The response that's traditionally been considered correct. So how do we do this, uh, this manipulation of conflict? So it's very easy. For example, it's easy to demonstrate with the base rate problem. So in the classic incongruent conflict version, right, the base rates and the description will cue conflicting responses, right? In a control problem, we're always going to introduce small 
content transformations, right, that, that uh, will result in the disappearance of this conflict. So over here, for example, you can just switch the base rates around, right? So now both the numbers, both the base rates and the description will give the exact same response. Description will tell you, well, this guy's probably going to be a Republican. The base rates will tell you, well, there are far more Republicans. This guy is probably going to be a Republican. So there's no conflicting information, no conflicting responses that are being queued. Okay. And you can do this for all these different problems that I showed you, right? You've already seen it today. For syllogisms, for example, you can do the exact same thing. You can make a, can, can present a conclusion in which the believability, uh, you can present a syllogism in which the believability of the conclusion will conflict with its logical validity, yes or no. So you can manipulate the presence of conflicts. And what we're going to do in all the studies that I'm going to show you, we're going to use some processing measures that allow us to test whether or not people are going to process these two different versions differently, right? Now, if people are not detecting conflict, right? People are not, for example, taking the base rates into account, right? The only difference between these two versions is exactly that we switch the base rates around, right? So if you're purely neglecting the base rates, right? You're not taking them into account, then you should not process these two versions differently, right? If people detect in these problems that, there's, that there is actually a conflict, you might expect that that's going to affect their processing and that might result in, for example, them taking longer to solve the conflict versus no conflict problems. Okay, is that clear? Because that's really the key prediction. It's testing whether or not there's going to be a differential cognitive treatment of those different, of those two different versions. Okay, yeah? Okay, so a first uh, study that I'm going to show you, a study in which we used a gaze tracking method. Design is really easy. For example, we presented people with base rate problems, half of the problems conflict versions, half of the problems no conflict versions, right? And we presented these problems in a serial fashion. So we first presented the base rates, right? We told participants, well, we're going to show you the, different, uh, the problems in two different parts, right? You start by reading the first part. Whenever you're ready, you hit space bar. And we told them then the first part is going to disappear and the second part is going to be presented. And we also told them, you know, once the second part is presented, if you want to, you can always go back to the first part. And they had to do that, by, for example, by pressing the uh, arrow key, okay? If they did that, then the first part would be presented, visualized again, okay? Now this allows us, this, you can use this as an index of conflict sensitivity, right? You can imagine, that's what we reason at least, um, if people, after they have uh, read the base rates, if at this point, right, when the intuitive heuristic response is being queued, if people take the base rates into account and notice that there's a conflict, you might, um, you, know, you might assume that people are going to go, okay, so I think this guy is going to be a Republican because of the things he did, right? But didn't they just tell me that there were more Republicans in the sample? So the idea is here that if people are sensitive to this conflict between the base rates that are presented and the description, right, they should be more likely to go back to the base rates to double check them, right? to verify them. Now you might reason, well, of course, I mean, if there's a, a part of the problem that is disappearing, people are always will tend to go back to that part of the problem that uh, disappeared, right? So that's why it's so important to, the critical contrast here is always the difference between the baseline, so the no conflicts, control problems, and the control problems. So the critical prediction here is that if people are specifically sensitive to the presence of conflict, they should be more likely to go back to the base rate information for the conflict problems. Okay? Yeah? Okay. So that's one measure you can use, gaze tracking, whether or not people are reviewing the base rates, yes or no. A second measure that you can use is actually testing people's recall of the base rate information. So in the actual study, what we did, so during the reasoning, 
task, people, uh, during 10 minutes, people are presented with different base rate problems. Each problem has different contents. Then after those 10 minutes of reasoning, we give them a five minute break. And then we give them an unannounced surprise recall task, right? And what we're testing is whether or not they're able to um, recall the base rate information. So this would be an example of the recall, the recall task. So we told them, well, you know, five minutes ago during the reasoning tasks, one of the items that we presented dealt with Bruce Springsteen and Justin Bieber fans, for example. Do you remember how many Bruce Springsteen and how many Justin Bieber fans were there actually in the sample? The idea is here, based on a classic finding in the memory field, the levels of processing idea, if people are indeed going to go back to the base with information when there's a conflict, right? They're going to spend longer processing that information, the reviewing then. That deeper, longer processing should result in a better recall of that information, right? Just as when you're studying for your exams, the longer you study, the better you will memorize that information. That's the idea here, right? So this recall measure allows us to test that same hypothesis. Are people showing sensitivity to the presence of conflict in the traditional uh, incongruent problems? Okay, so results, first of all, accuracy. We replicate a very classic finding for the conflict problems. You know, you get only maximum 20% correct responses. That what you, that's what you expect. That's the classic kahneman Tversky finding. For the no-conflict problems, of course, everyone is given the correct response. You get very high accuracy. Why? Because even the intuitive system one is queuing the correct response. There's no conflict. Okay, so you can't go wrong over there. The critical finding over here is, if you look at, re at uh, the review tendency and at recall, we do get a, a better recall of the base with information for the conflict problems, right? And remember, the only difference between those two versions was that we switched the base rates around. So if people would not be uh, paying attention to the base rates, right, would not be sensitive to the presence of conflict between the response that's being queued by the base rates and the description, they shouldn't process those two different versions differently, right? So what you get here is that people are not recalling, uh, are not giving the correct response, but they are reviewing the base rate information and they are able to tell you after the reasoning task which of the two groups was actually the largest, right? So people are processing the base rate information specifically when there's conflict that's really directing people's attention towards the base rate information. Okay, so you might argue here, well, you know, here there were at least like 20% of the people who are given the correct response. So what you could argue is that these guys and girls are actually driving the effects, right? And that's an important point because both views, both the parallel and the serial view, all theorists agree that people who are given the correct response, they should detect conflicts, right? So the fact that people who are responding correctly, the fact that they should show this tendency should not be a surprise. That's what everybody is predicting, right? So here, these data specifically refer to the performance of the people who give incorrect responses, right? And most of the time, we even run analyses for really the worst of the worst reasoners in our sample. Just me simply meaning people for all the different problems that we're presenting them who consistently give the incorrect biased response, right? So even when you focus the analysis specifically on those people, you still get this effect, really showing that the reason that these people are biased, are giving the incorrect response, is not that they didn't notice that there was a problem with the intuitive response, right? Because them two, they're recalling the correct base for the information and they're reviewing the base for the information. Now what's important also is to point out that this process seems to be fully implicit. So in one of the studies that we run is, what we did is we used a thinking aloud approach so we simply asked people to say out loud whatever it was that they were thinking about, right? And initially what we figured is that if people are going to do that, right, they should mention the base rate information. So if they're picking up on the conflict, people should say something as, okay, I think this guy is going to be a Republican because he worked in the oil business, although there were more Democrats, right? You would imagine that people would at least mention the base rate information, right? Now, when we ran that study, results were really clear that almost never happens, right? It's only the people who are giving actually correct responses 
for referring to the base rate information during a thinking aloud study. For the incorrect responders, you only get about uh, two or three percent of the trials where actually people are mentioning the base rate, base rate information. Right? So that's why we're labeling this as an implicit gut feeling uh, phenomenon or process. People know that there's something fishy about the intuitive response whenever there's conflict, but they can't put their finger on it. They can't verbalize it, they, they can't explicitate what it is that they're feeling or noticing. Okay? Okay, so that's one study. Um, so what we've been trying to do is come up with different procedures, different methods that allow us to test the same hypothesis, just to be sure to have convergent evidence that the findings were really solid and robust. So I showed you that um, the logical part of the, of the problem is actually better remembered whenever there's conflict, right? So people process the base for the information. You get that information is more accessible after people have solved the conflict problem versus no conflict problem. So you might wonder, so what happens with the heuristic information, right? the information about the Russell in this uh, example. Now the classic idea in the reasoning field is that if you want to reason correctly, what you need to do is you need to block that intuitive heuristic response, right? You need to not think about Republicans, right? You need to block the stereotype. You need to override that response. Now if you go back to classic memory studies, you'll see that this inhibition idea actually refers to a temporary inaccessibility of a memory trace. Right? The idea is that while you're reasoning, if you're trying not to think about something, you're going to deactivate that information. And that implies that if you, right after that, if you want to re-access that same information, you're going to pay a small price. Access to that memory trace will be distorted, and it's going to take a little bit longer, for example, to access that information and you can me measure that temporary inaccessibility with a number of classic tasks, for example, a lexical decision task. I'm going to show you right away what it is. So we used this idea in our study to further validate uh, our findings or our hypothesis. So what did we do? We first present people with a reasoning problem, for example, a base rate problem, right? Immediately after participants has entered this response, we start a lexical decision task, right? So what is a lexical decision task? Very easy. A string of letters is presented on screen, and people simply have to say whether or not that string of letters is a word, yes or no. So in this case, they would go, no, it's not a word, right? Here they would say, yes, that's a word. Yes, that's a word, okay? So that's the idea. Now the critical manipulation here is that Half of the trials, half of the words that were presented uh, in the lexical decision task were what we call target words, words that are strongly related to the stereotype, to the intuitive response that's being cued during the reasoning task. Right? Now, the idea is that if people indeed try to inhibit this information while they're reasoning, while they're solving the conflict problems, right? then it should take them a little bit longer to access that same information during the lexical decision task, right? Because the idea is that when you're solving a conflict problem, you're trying to inhibit the stereotypical intuitive response, right? It means that you're going to deactivate that information. You're not going to think about uh, Republicans, gun, oil, ranches, right? So if I present you that same word right after the reasoning task, right? that access to that word will remain inhibited for some time. So it's going to take you a little bit longer, we're talking about a couple of milliseconds here, to access that information during the lexical decision task. So in order to decide whether or not gun is a word, yes or no, you have to access it in memory. That's the idea, right? And here again, the critical control are the no conflict problems, right? Because there, there's no conflict, there's no reason to inhibit your intuitive response on the no conflict control problems, because there's no conflict, right? It's perfectly fine to base your response on the intuitively cute response uh, in those cases, right? So we're going to test whether or not people actually need more time to make their lexical decisions. 
40 conflict problems versus no conflict problems. And that's exactly what we find. You know, I told you we're talking about a very small effect here, like 20 milliseconds uh, on average. But indeed, people need a little bit longer to say whether or not gum is a word after they have solved the conflict problems versus no conflict problems. And what's important is that this effect is specifically tied to the target words, words that are strongly related to the stereotype that has been cued. Because you might argue, well, maybe you know, solving these conflict problems is just hard. Right? So afterwards, people will be a bit uh, exhausted. They will be tired. So that's why in the lexical decision task, they're going to take longer to uh, uh, respond to those words. But for the unrelated words, there's no effect whatsoever. So it's really tied to those words that have been cued during the reasoning task. An additional control study that we ran, so I told you, so the inhibition idea is a temporary inaccessibility of a memory trace. Of course, when you inhibit information during reasoning, for example, that doesn't mean that that information is gonna stay inhibited for like forever, right? The inhibition effect will taper off. After a while, that information becomes accessible again, right? So we used that insight uh, in this control study. So what we did is we just gave people a short delay between the reasoning task and the lexical decision task, right? We just had, had them sit there for a minute and wait, right? And then, so after you enter your response on the reasoning task, you have to wait for a minute, then you start lexical decision uh, task. And what you see is that you're no longer getting this effect, this increased decision times for the conflict problems after the delay. So that's fully consistent with the inhibitory account. So that's showing you that people are, and again, we're getting this pattern also for people who are giving the incorrect responses, so for the bad reasoners, right? So that's really showing you that these people are sensitive to the presence of conflict, right? And they do realize or de detect that there's a problem with the intuitive response because they're trying to inhibit it. If that would not be the case, if people would be purely intuitive system one reasoners, again, then there just should be no difference in the way that they treat or process the conflicts and the no conflict problems. Okay? Okay, that's just two studies and most, this idea of the fact that people are detecting conflict uh, doesn't fit with the dominant default interventionist serial uh, model of a uh, dual process model and therefore a lot of people do not like it so it was in order to convince the community that this was really something real what we've been trying to do is just use different methods and different tasks also to show people that it's not just one or the other random confound that's explaining these uh, uh, effects but really that we have a very solid robust uh, phenomenon that we're looking at here okay so in one study, we uh, decided to use uh, fMRI to test this hypothesis. Why? Because there's a lot of um, research uh, on, in uh, the field of uh, neuropsychology that's showing that conflict detection and inhibition are mediated by different parts of the brain, right? Conflict uh, detection would be mediated by the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, the medial part of the frontal lobe, so about here. Um, Inhibition would be mediated by the lateral prefrontal cortex, right? Let's see. Um, I have a lot of work by Bob Finnick, Carver, the classic conflict monitoring hypothesis of ACC functioning. Okay, so basic idea, we have two different regions of the brain that we know that are engaged in conflict, eter conflict detection versus inhibition. So what we decided to do is we put our participants in an fMRI scanner, right? Give them our base rate problems, half of them conflict, half of them no conflicts, and we're gonna measure the activation in those two uh, regions, right? And we're specifically interested in what will happen when people are giving the incorrect response to the incongruent problems, right? If people are detecting conflicts when they're processing these classic incongruent conflict problems, right? If they're detecting that there's a, plop, a problem that there are conflicting uh, responses at play, then you should get activation in the ACC even when people are giving incorrect responses. And this is the result for the critical contrast. So what we did is we contra 
contrasted the activation for correctly and incorrectly solved conflict problems, right? And what you get is that you get a differential activation in the right lateral prefrontal cortex, so the area that's supposed to be mediating inhibition. And that's what everybody is expecting, right? All theories agree. If you're, inhibit, if you're giving the correct response, you need to override, you need to inhibit the intuitive response. Therefore, when you give the correct response versus incorrect response, more activation in the inhibition region. Fine, no problem. Okay. Key finding here that is that, that we're not getting any differential activation in the ACC, so the conflict detection area, right? We do get ACC activation even for incorrect responders when we contrast the conflicts and the no conflict trials. So the ACC is activated when people are solving the conflict problems, but there's no difference when you contrast correctly solved and incorrectly solved problems, suggesting that the ACC is equally active on people, uh, whether people are giving a correct or incorrect, or incorrect response, right? Pointing to the, the idea that people are uh, consistent with the behavioral data, are already detecting conflict even when they give the incorrect response. Okay. Uh, that's a study that I ran actually when I was a postdoc in a VNUT's lab, VNUT Goel who gave the a keynote yesterday, for those of you who are there. Okay. You might argue, well, that's just an fMRI study, and you can show about anything with fMRI, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree. So what we decided to do is another study, just to test, again, the same hypothesis. And what we decided to do is look at people's skin conductance during reasoning. Okay. Why? Because there's some good evidence that the anterior cingulate cortex, so the brain's conflict detector, is also implicated in autonomic nervous system modulation. The idea is that uh, whenever people are exposed to conflict, right, you get anterior cingulate cortex ac activation that will trigger some autonomic uh, nervous system activation. Right? So the autonomic nervous system is just the nervous system that's managing uh, the expression of our uh, bodily functions such as respiration, temperature, etc. Right? So the idea is that if that system is activated, you know, get an increase in activation, that results, for example, in a change in your skin conductance. Right? You know that your skin has a certain um, 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 electric, uh, electrical potential, right? You can measure this, how well that your skin is uh, conducting um, electricity. The idea is if the autonomic nervous system is activated, so if the anterior cingulate cortex is activated, right, increased autonomic nervous system activation and increased uh, skin conductance responses, right? And you can measure this just by uh, putting some electrodes on people's hands, right, on their fingers, and that allows you to measure how well uh, you send a small uh, current through those ele electrodes and you can actually test how well that your uh, skin is uh, conducting that electric current. So that allows you to measure the activation of the anterior cingulate cortex. So that's what we did is basically measure those uh, skin conductance responses during reasoning. Okay. And if you do that, what you get here is, yeah, I'm calling these good and bad reasons, just people who give the classic uh, correct response typically for the majority of, of cases and people who give the incorrect response. And what you see is that even for people who are giving the incorrect responses, you get this increase in skin conductance when they're solving, when they're solving the conflict problems, right? So even though they're not giving the correct response, right, their skin is showing sensitivity to the fact that there's a problem over here, right? That there's a, a conflict between the acute intuitive response and the correct response. Again, the only difference between these versions is, for example, in the base rate problems, that you switch the base rates around, right? Okay. Now, you might argue, and that's what some reviewers did, is that, okay, perfectly fine. You've been showing us that some part of our brain is sensitive to the presence of conflict in those traditional reasoning problems. Fine. But you could argue, well, that's not really showing you 
that we're actually using that signal during reasoning, right? As one reviewer once put it, maybe our brain is smarter than we are. Now, I think that's reminding me of a very dangerous Cartesian dualism, but in a more general sense, you might get what the, what the reviewer was hinting at. Because in the end, we know that people are not given the correct response, right? When you're looking at their verbalizations, they're not mentioning the base rate information, right? But nevertheless, they are looking longer at the base rate information. They're, they're able to recall the base rate information. The anterior cingulate cortex is being activated. All of that, right? So you might argue, if people are indeed picking up on this conflict and people realize that intuitive response is not fully warranted, right? You should see some impact on the reasoning process. So what we decided to do is a very simple study in which we simply looked at people's confidence after they gave the response. So after people give a response to, our, uh, to every single problem, we ask them on a scale from 0 to 100 to indicate how certain that they are that their response is actually correct. Now if we are right, if people are detecting that there's a problem with the intuitive response that they're giving when they're solving the conflict problems, right? So they're detecting there's a conflict, but they can't put their finger on it, right? They can't verbalize, they can't explicitly why it's wrong. Then at the very least, if there's some detection going on, you should find that if you ask them how confident that they are, that their response is actually correct, you should find that people will be less confident after they have solved a conflict versus no conflict problem. Okay? And that would give you some... Um, more uh, maybe solid or clearer evidence for the idea that people sense that their answer is not fully warranted, the fact that their confidence is actually going down. And that's what we did for really uh, in a number of studies uh, for a very wide range of problems. The typical finding is that even for biased reasons for people who are giving the incorrect response, we're getting this confidence decrease. Right? So it's indeed the case that people are less confident about their response when they've solved a conflict problem suggesting that they are indeed sensitive to the presence of conflicts. Okay. Now, Henry has put me in the developmental section, or, uh, so you know, I have to tell a little bit about developments. Um, we've been running quite a few developmental studies with my colleagues in Paris, and basically I'm interested in this because it allows me to validate the findings um, uh, with adults that uh, I just showed you, right? Why? Because there's some pretty good evidence that the anterior cingulate cortex, so the brain region that's supposed to be mediating this conflict detection, right? There's a, a lot of evidence that it's pretty late to mature. You wouldn't see, you will, you will not see full functionality of the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, um, before the, uh, the end of uh, adolescence, so middle adolescence, right? So that actually points to a prediction, right? If I'm right that, for example, these confidence decreases that we're observing with adults when they're solving conflict problems, if they actually result from successful conflict detection, then when we're testing a group of participants, children, for, which, for whom we know it is conflict detection, is theoretically less likely, right? And we should be less likely to observe those effects, right? So put differently, with adults, we know that even when they're biased, they seem to know that the response is not fully warranted. For kids, the prediction is because they should not be able or less able to detect conflicts, right? Whenever they're giving an incorrect response, they should be very certain that the response is actually correct. So they shouldn't show this conf uh, confidence drop. Okay, so that's what we did in a number of studies. Um, the one thing I have to tell you about these studies is, of course, all the material is piloted, right? So we always pick stereotypes, material, that are known to the youngest reasoners in our sample. Why? Well, let's say that you're going to test a 10-year-old with the Republicans versus Democrat problem that I just showed you, right? Because they don't know what, what a Republican is, that implies that the problem is not going to cue an intuitive heuristic response. So, of course, they're not going to detect conflict, not because they're not necessarily good at detecting conflict, but because the problem is not generating a conflict, right? So you have to make sure that you're using material 
uh, that's familiar for even your uh, youngest participants. So that's what we did in a bunch of pilot studies. And then in the data that I'm going to show you, we just contrasted the performance of young adolescents and late adolescents. So about uh, 13, 14 year of age and 16 year of age. Okay, and this is what we get for the late adolescents. We get the effect that we observed with adults, so a significant comf uh, confidence decrease. And the key finding is that there's an interaction here, right? This effect is um, much less pronounced for the young adolescents, consistent with the idea that these guys are struggling with conflict detection. And in follow-up studies, we've done this. We've tried to completely eliminate the, the effect because there's an interaction over here, but there's still a significant decrease, right? So the effect is smaller over here, but it's still significant. But if you push this even further and you test, uh, for example, 12-year-old reasoners, right? You'll see, oh, um, sorry, even younger reasoners, 8-year-old reasoners in one study that we use, and you'll see that there's no longer any difference, no significant difference between their confidence in the conflicts and the no conflict problems. Okay. So basically what we see is that we're not seeing significant conflict detection effects in these types of studies before the end of uh, elementary school. Of course, I'm not saying here that kids will never detect conflict. That's not what I'm saying, right? I'm talking here about conflict detection during logical and probabilistic reasoning, right? So we're looking at tasks that are pretty hard. Even with adults, most of these tasks, we're only looking at accuracy rates of about 20%. Right? If you test this, uh, kids with easier tasks, you can show that they are showing some sensitivity to the presence of conflict. So that's something that we did, for example, with uh, a number of conservation tasks, for example. You can actually show that in that case, preschoolers will detect uh, conflicts. Okay? So I'm talking here about the uh, logical and probabilistic reasoning task that I introduced in the beginning of my talk. Okay, so just to sum up, so there's a lot of evidence based on different methods using different paradigms that point to this conflict sensitivity. Fine. So by using different methods, using different tasks, right, I only focused on the basic problems over here just because it's easier to demonstrate um, these studies with that format, but we made sure to test whether or not these findings generalized across different reasoning tasks, just to be sure, just as with the methods, that the results are not being driven by one specific potential confound in one or the other tasks, right? So it seems to be a pretty general thing, and I'm not the only one, that's probably the most important thing, finding these effects, right? So there are different labs across the world have been reporting uh, similar effects, right? So I think we have a very good empirical case to make to argue that conflict detection is typically successful in these types of tasks, right? So the reason that people are biased is not that they're not detecting that there's a problem with the intuitive response. Fine, right? That's the empirical data. And the second question is, if people are detecting these conflicts, if they're showing sensitivity to violations of traditional norms, right, how are they doing this? As I told you, um, people who have um, proponents of the parallel dual process model, Epstein and Sloan, for example, they've always, at least implicitly, argued that people will be sensitive to the presence of conflict, that people will detect conflict. Why? Because they're assuming that both systems, system one and system two, are being activated at the same time. And therefore, some people have interpreted these results as implying that the parallel process model was correct. But that's not that what we're saying, because in the parallel processing, processing model, successful conflict detection is explained by the fact that system two will be activated simultaneously with system one, right? So under that view, conflict detection is supposed to be a hard, difficult process, right? It's resulting from successful system two engagement. And basically what we're proposing that, what we're looking at here is basically a system one process. We're looking at conflict between two competing intuitions. That's our theoretical claim, right? So I've argued that these findings, empirical findings that are pointing to biased reasoners, conflict sensitivity, right? They call for the postulation of logical intuitions. And what do I mean with a logical intuition? 
basically the idea is that people intuitively grasp standard logical and probabilistic principles and they automatically activate these when they're faced with a reasoning problem. Okay? That's the idea. So, where's the evidence here? Why am I saying that this is an implicit intuitive system one process? Well, first of all, as I already showed you, if you actually ask people to justify what they're doing, to verbalize what they're uh, doing through a reasoning task, you'll see that people are not verbalizing any conflict and people do not manage to justify why the response that they're, that they're giving, why it wouldn't be correct, right? So people feel that there's something fishy about their response, they're less confident about it, but they can't tell you why. And one of the um, criteria for system two deliberate processing is the fact that people should be able to explicit or justify why uh, the response is uh, correct, yes uh, or no. So there should be some justification there if it's really a system two process. Right. But the more critical thing is that we have some very good evidence that this process, this detection process is really automatic. First of all, we find these conflict detection effect even for the least gifted reasoners in our samples, right? People who consistently give the incorrect biased response. And we know that that is associated with working memory capacity thanks to Keith Stanovich's work, right? So we get uh, successful detection even for the least gifted, cognitively gifted participants in our sample. If the process, the detection process, would be a demanding system two process, you would assume that people who have more resources should be better at it. Okay, that's not what we're finding. Everyone is showing it. Okay. And we also tested this directly by simply using a dual task procedure, right? By knocking out system two. So what we do in those cases is we simply uh, before people are presented with a reasoning problem, we give them, present them a secondary task. For example, we present this dot pattern or this pattern of crosses. Before the reasoning problem is presented, we tell people, well, you have to memorize this while they're reasoning. That is going to burden their executive resources, right? They indicate um, the response, confidence, and afterwards, they have to indicate it where the crosses were located. And we know that that task, that secondary task, is going to burden people's executive resources. Now, if this detection process during reasoning draws on these very same exec executive resources, right, it should become less efficient under load. Right? If it's purely automatic, then burdening your cognitive resources with a secondary task shouldn't have an impact on your performance. And that's exactly what we're finding. We're getting these effects, these detection effects, even under load. Right? Load is not having an impact on um, people's uh, detection performance. So I think that's really good evidence for the claim that it's, that it's really automatic. Okay, but uh, one problem is that you might uh, wonder, so why are, wh where are these logical intuitions coming from, right? As one reviewer didn't really like our approach, one said, you know, did God put these logical intuitions in our brain? Where are they coming from, right? But actually, the idea that people would show some intuitive logical sensitivity or sensitivity to some basic logical and probabilistic principles, if you look at the developmental evidence, it's actually not so shocking or strange, right? Because there are a lot of studies showing that even at very, very young ages, so studies with babies that are a couple months old, right? You can show that they show some logical sensitivity or sensitivity to these very basic principles that are evoked in the classic heuristics and decision-making tasks. For example, the fact that ratios matter, that proper proportionality is important. Just to point to one study by uh, Taglas and, and colleagues, in these studies what they do, for example, they'll present a, a box with moving objects on a screen, right? And there's an opening in the box and the, uh, every now and then one of the objects will leave the box. So you have a box with, let's say, five yellow objects and one blue object, right? They're just bouncing randomly in the box and every now and then an object will leave the box, right? Now what they do in these studies, they measure actually how long that kids are looking at an object when it leaves the box, right? And there are two conditions 
a probable, a probable and an improbable condition. So in one condition, for example, you will have five yellow objects and one blue object in the box, right? And then a yellow object might leave the box. So in that case, the yellow object will be more probable because there is more yellow objects in the box. In the other condition, you will have, uh, let's say, five yellow objects and one blue object, and it will be the blue object, so the improbable object, that will leave the box, right? And what they show is that even with kids that are only a couple months old, they will look longer at the improbable events, right? Showing that they can already, at a couple, when they're a couple months old, they can process proportionality. They know it should be more likely that an object will leave, that the objects that are more numerous, more yellow objects than blue objects, then it should be more likely that the yellow object will leave the box, right? And there's actually quite a lot of, uh, quite a few, quite a few studies that show this sensitivity or this very um, early capacity for um, not logical reasoning, but at least sensitivity to logical uh, principles. And they even show this, for example, with monkeys. Monkeys can do it too, right? And basically that's all you need to solve, for example, the base rate problem. You have to know that if there's more of x than of y, then x should become more likely, right? So knowing that, then it shouldn't, it's not that unlikely that 18 years later, you know, when students are coming to the lab, they're being tested, being presented with these reasoning problems. The fact that this information might be after like at least 12 years of formal education, right? When they're presented with a reasoning task in the lab, that this information is going to get activated, it's not so shocking, at least not to me, based on if you look at all uh, the evidence. Now you might be a bit confused here because I, when I showed you uh, our own developmental studies, I showed you that kids are not good at detecting conflict, right? But you have to take into account here, when I'm talking about the studies that I ran, right, with classic heuristics and biases tasks, we're always looking at situations where a very strong intuitive response is skewed that will conflict with the logical response, right? In these types of situations, when they're testing the very young babies, right, these are called what we, yeah, neutral or abstract problems. These problems are not evoking, not cueing a strong intuitive response, right? So the reason that uh, children in our studies are not detecting conflict, it's not that they don't, do not have the logical knowledge. It's simply because whenever the problem is cueing a strong intuitive response, it's hard for kids to monitor for, for conflict, right? But even at a very young age, you can show that children already have this capacity. Okay. And as um, Lyndon already mentioned this, this, this morning, uh, you know, there's a lot of critique uh, on this idea in the field. Uh, for example, Henrik Singman, who's a very good friend of mine who, who really hates this, uh, this work, uh, has argued, well, basically the idea that people would show some intuitive sensitivity to logical principles, right, could do logic intuitively, doesn't fit with a very, very long tradition of research in, on reasoning and, and decision making, right? So whenever um, you're making extraordinary claims, you should better be sure to have some very extraordinary evidence. So all I'm saying here is that we have in my view, at least, a very reasonable set of findings, a very convincing set of findings that support this idea. But not everyone in the field will, uh, will agree. Keep it in mind. Now, this idea has some impl important implications for the dual process uh, model because it actually allows you to um, explain how system, know, how system two, so the deliberate system, can know when it needs to kick in, right? Because that's a real problem for a purely serial model, okay? If you're assuming that people rely on an intuitive system by default and will recruit system two or the deliberate system whenever there's a conflict detected between your system one and system two, you're actually being faced with a logical paradox because over here, how, is it, how would it be possible that, you know, that the system two 
how can system two detect that there's a conflict with system one if it's not even engaged yet, right? So that's a problem for any purely serial model. You need to deal with that problem. And that problem is solved in a parallel model because they're assuming that people are engaging in deliberate and intuitive processing simultaneously. Of course, you can explain why people would be uh, sensitive to the presence or would detect the presence of conflict. But the problem for the parallel model is that it's assuming that the deliberate system is always engaged, right? And from a cognitive economy point of view, that's totally, um, it's highly unlikely, right? Because the deliberate system draws on executive reason, uh, resources. We know that those are limited. If we would be engaging in deliberate thinking the whole time, we would be wasting a lot of cognitive resources, precisely because in a lot of situations, the intuitive system will cue a valid, good, proper response, right? So in a lot of situations, we don't really actually need the deliberate system. So if we're going to engage it, engage it always from the start, that's not very uh, economical, right? So in an evolutionary sense, you're wasting a lot of valuable resources. That would be quite unlikely. So this logical intuition idea is actually solving that puzzle. If you accept that what people are actually doing is detecting conflict between a heuristic intuition, so based on uh, some semantic information or some um, uh, beliefs, right, and an intuitive logical intuition, then you can actually argue that the deliberate system will only be engaged whenever there's conflict between those two. When there's no conflict between those two, right, you can stay in system one mode and you don't need to activate your system two. So you're giving system two here a switch decision rule to know whether or not it needs to be engaged, right? And you can explain why people are, being, are showing sensitivity to conflicts between intuitions, heuristics, and logical considerations. Okay, that's just the very simple idea. That's all it is. I mean, people are, these tasks are queuing uh, competing intuitions, a in, uh, heuristic intuition and a logical intuition. It's not a very complicated model, but you can use it to build more complex models, and that's basically all what I'm saying. So a good example is, for example, Gord Pennycook's recent model where he's using that insight, the fact that there might be conflict between different intuitions, Right? You can build on this. That's basically what I'm arguing for, that people should take this seriously and take it into account in their theories uh, and models. And that's what Gord is doing, for example. Now, what I really want to point out is that I'm not saying that people have always correct logical intuitions. That's definitely not the idea. Right? So I'm not saying when that when Homer Simpson is solving some very hard nuclear physics equations, he will have correct logical intuitions, right? We're talking here about classic heuristics and biases tasks. And basically my argument here is that these tasks are really simple, right? The logical and probabilistic principles that are evoked in these tasks are really pretty basic. The idea is that people grasp these basic principles. And why are they basic? Well, you can actually show that from a very young age, people, uh, children sh uh, show already sensitivity, have some knowledge of these principles. So what I'm saying here is that, because recently in the popular literature, there are uh, a number of, uh, well, recently, the work of Gladwell, for example, and uh, in the scientific field, uh, Dijksterhaus, for example, they have been uh, arguing that people should rely more on system one, right? That system one is more powerful than system two, right? People should blink and don't think. That's the idea. And that's not what I'm saying here, right? Because they're arguing basically that system one is more, has a higher capacity than system two, is more advanced. The only idea here, right, is that system one is also queuing these simple logical and probabilistic principles, right? Okay, uh, how am I doing time-wise? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're in, probably I'm just gonna 
I'll, I can do it quickly. So basically all of this has also implications for our view of individual differences. The idea is that whatever your view on the nature of bias is will have implications for your view on the nature of individual differences. If you believe that people are biased because they fail to inhibit um, heuristic response, right? Then if you have to account for, for the fact that people, uh, some people will manage to do this and will be better at inhibiting certain information than other people, it will be driven by that compound. If you believe, for example, that people are biased because they don't know logical principles, you could call this a storage failure, right? Then if you have to explain why some people might be able or are able to give the correct response, you would um, link this to this component. So you would argue that those people have stored the correct logical information, right? Basically, there are a wide range of different views here in, in the field. And what uh, Jean-Francois Bonfort and I have suggested is that you can basically put these on a timeline from early to late in the reasoning process, right? So what we're arguing for is that if it's indeed the case that people are detecting conflicts, right, that implies that people have stored the critical logical principles, logical information. People know these principles. They are detecting that there's a conflict between these principles and acute heuristic response. But the reason that they fail to give the correct response is because they fail at the inhibition component. But the idea is that this process, right, can be localized pretty late in the reasoning process, right? So at the start, the idea is that we're all doing the same. We all have logical insights, we all have the, lo the necessary no logical knowledge. We're detecting at the second stage that there's a conflict between the logic and the heuristics. Why do we diverge? Why do some people give the correct response and others don't? Because some people will fail, will succeed at the inhibition and others won't. So that's at the very last stage of the reasoning process that's when the divergence uh, is occurring. Okay. Just a take home message, what I'm trying to show here, is that people show some sensitivity to violation of traditional logical and probabilistic norms. If people show that sensitivity, that implies that they have some basic knowledge of these principles. And I also showed you that people activate these automatically because we get these conflict detection effects even when we knock out system two, even under loads. That has some implications for dual process models. There's a case to make for logical intuitions. For a view of human rationality, it suggests that people are smarter than the bias suggests, right? Because the reason that you're giving an incorrect response is not that you don't know the correct response. It's not that you do not realize that your intuitive response is actually not fully warranted. It's because you fail to inhibit that tempting intuitive response, okay. And it has some implications for a view of individual differences, suggesting that these are quite late to arrive in the reasoning process. And that's it, I'm gonna stop here. Thanks a lot for listening.